Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ken Green. As well as being head of sport and exercise sciences at the University of Chester, I teach in the sociology of physical education, sport and leisure. This short lecture entitled Sports Participation in Scandinavia and the Nordic Countries, What Can We Learn in the UK? is part of the university's kitchen series. And although I'm not in the kitchen as such, if the kettle gets switched on, you'll soon realise just how close I am. This lecture is a mini version of a, finally, a session I do on a module entitled Issues in Physical Education and Youth Sport, in which I explore what locks people into sports participation and what role, if any, school PE might play in that process. Now, normally when I lecture, I walk around a lot, I throw my arms around a lot, I tell a lot of jokes, show a lot of power slides and cartoons. Today, I'm restricted to the chair, so I may just have to make do with waving my arms around. If you make a note of any questions you may have as I go along, I'll fill these at the end. These can be questions about what I've said or anything to do with uh, the PE in Sport and Exercise Sciences degree here at Chester. Now, the lecture is loosely based upon a book entitled Sport in Scandinavia and the Nordic Countries, prop number one. The Nordic countries, i.e. the Scandinavian lands of Denmark, Norway and Sweden, plus Finland, Finland and Iceland and Greenland, are of interest because they have the highest levels of sports participation in Europe and probably the world. Now, I want to briefly describe sports participation in the Nordic countries and then try to explain these high levels of participation with a view to answering the question, what, if anything, can we learn in the UK from this? Now, I should just point out that I'm defining sport very broadly to include physical exercise and physical recreation. And I can say more about the distinctions between these terms at the end, if that helps. Now, contrary to popular belief, sports participation increased significantly across the Western world in the late 1970s and through the early 1980s. However, the continued growth in participation into the new millennium marks many of the Nordic countries out by comparison with other countries around the world. Where participation plateaued in the 1990s and has remained more or less stagnant ever since, particularly true in the UK. Country by country differences notwithstanding, more people are doing a good deal more sport more often in the Nordic region than elsewhere. I mean, put simply, the normal bell-shaped curve, the archetypal bell-shaped curve of sports participation, where you have a small number of people doing a little, a small number of people doing an awful lot, but most people in the middle. Well, in the Nordic regions, that's become what scientists call, sports scientists call a negatively skewed distribution. And it's moved towards the more active end. Fewer people doing a little, a lot of people doing at least something, if not quite a lot, as well as a lot. In short, among young and older alike, the proportions of those who never participate in Nordic countries or do so rarely has diminished in size, while the proportions participating regularly several times a week has increased. Indeed, the most marked differences over time in Nordic countries have been among those who exercise a lot. Approximately nine out of 10 adults in Finland, for example, participate in at least two to three times each week. Half of adult Norwegians take part in sport three to four times a week, with one in 10, 10% taking part daily. Another distinctive feature of sports participation in Norway, Norway as an example, is a relatively high level of regular participation among youth. More than two thirds of Norwegian youth participate three to four times each week. This contrasts markedly with the 10% of 15 to 24 year olds exercising regularly in the European Union countries. Now, the high rates in sports participation among 16 to 19 year olds in the Nordic countries is significant, not least because it's counterintuitive. It kind of doesn't stack up. In many countries around the world, the peak period for participation in sport tends to be around ages 10 to 12, typically coinciding with the transition from primary to secondary schooling. In Nordic countries, however, participation peaks during a period characteristically associated with substantial drop off, i.e. doing less, and quite often drop out, like stopping completely from sport. That's to say it coincides with the late teens. Around one in third of 16 to 19 year old Norwegians participate almost daily, and 40% participate three to four times each week. So 50 years or so ago, sport around the world was a pastime for young males. Nowadays, sport is populated by all age and ethnic groups and both sexes, 
Increasing proportions of all Nordic people have been taking part in sport from younger and younger ages through to later and later in life. 50 years ago, sport was just that, physically vigorous, competitive, organised activities. Nowadays, when we talk of sport, we need to refer to it in inverted commas to reflect the fact that conventional sports, team games and the like, have been supplemented by a broad and diverse range of so-called lifestyle sports, recreational informal sports, in the participatory repertoires of Nordic people in particular. Nordic people and the young especially are engaged in broader and more diverse forms of sport. There has been this shift towards individual and small group participation in lifestyle recreational activities and in commercial settings and away from team games and formal settings such as sports clubs. In this regard, trends in sports participation in the region are similar, although at exaggerated levels, to trends elsewhere in the Western world. Participation in individual sports have been growing over the past three decades, whilst participation in team sports has declined. Now, among adult and older age groups, the most popular lifestyle activities tend to be health and fitness, gym-based oriented activities, walking, cycling, spinning, running, swimming and the like. Among youth, these are more likely to be strength training and gym activities, body sculpting activities, as well as alternative sports such as BMX and more adventurous activities, mountain biking and the like. Among children, the more popular activities remain predominantly club-based games, increasingly supplemented by lifestyle activities, such as the various forms of boarding and blading. In this regard, it's important to keep in mind that while lifestyle recreational sports have been growing in appeal around the world, but in the Nordic countries in particular, games remain popular, especially among the young. Now, Average levels of sports participation are, of course, an outcome of some groups doing more, other groups doing less. The big picture provided by averages inevitably conceals differences within socio-demographic groups. And once again, however, these differences are a good deal less marked in the Nordic countries than elsewhere. The averages conceal relatively small deviations from the mean in Nordic countries. In all walks of Nordic life, there's been a narrowing of socio-economic differentials during the latter decades of the 20th century. This corresponded with a weakening of the major social divisions in Nordic lands, particularly in relation to age and gender in sports participation. Age differences in particular have diminished in Nordic countries. And three things stand out in relation to age and sports participation in the Nordic lands. First, a marked trend towards increased participation in the last 20 or 30 years across all age groups. Levels of participation have risen, in particular among older age groups, and many whose participation diminishes during the 30s and 40s return to sport in later life. Nordic countries, in other words, witness the kind of bounce back in regular sports participation not seen elsewhere in the world. That's to say, a bounce back after the main working and child rearing years to levels associated with mid 20s. These renewed levels of participation then tend to be sustained by Nordic peoples into old age. Thus, the dip in participation during the middle years is relatively shallow in the Nordic countries. And middle age is more likely to be associated with drop off, doing little less in sports participation rather than drop out, simply ceasing to participate at all. Regular participation has been increasing markedly among young Nordics in particular. Indeed, many Nordic youngsters are the, what we'd call the quintessential sporting omnivores in at least two senses. First, they engage with a wide range of sporting forms. Second, they're inclined to dabble in and experiment with a wide range of different activities. The upshot is that sport and exercise have become normative. They've become taken for granted among young and old alike in the Nordic lands, especially in the Scandinavian countries. Now, a marked feature of the general democratization of sport has been a convergence between the sexes. And there are two main take home messages regarding gender and sports participation in the Nordic region. The first is increased rates of participation among females, such that levels of female participation tend to be higher in the Nordic countries than elsewhere in the world. The increases in sports participation among girls and women fueled the general increases in participation since the 1970s and continue to do so. 
The second take home message is one of convergence in levels of participation, if not as yet forms of participation. Since the 1970s, rates of sports participation among girls and women have been moving towards the previously considerably higher levels of participation among boys and, boys and men. Indeed, against some measures, female participation has surpassed male participation in Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden. The clear convergence, the clear coming together between males and females in sports participation notwithstanding, a number of gender stereotypical features remain relatively intact. For example, men and women, girls and boys, still tend to be found disproportionately in gender stereotypical male or female sporting forms. Sports participation, especially over the longer term, is demanding. Of course it is, not only in terms of time, but also money. The financial costs of sport can, of course, be significant. Money in all walks of leisure life, all walks of life, makes it possible for people to do more of the things they already do or that those around them do that they would like to do. Money facilitates sport in particular in the form of transport, getting to and from, equipment, gear, coaching, club memberships, so on. Money saves time and it enables what sociologists call individual sovereignty. It enables in effect great, greater degree of autonomy, control over your leisure and sporting life. So economic capital, money, is one reason that the attachments to sport of players from lower socioeconomic groups around the world tend to be fragile. However, social class differences are relatively narrow in the Nordic lands in relation to the rest of Europe. And over time, the gaps between social class fractions have been closing, most notably among the young. Growing evidence of a recent widening of relative inequalities in all the Scandinavian and Nordic countries notwithstanding, a recent review of sports participation in Norway revealed that despite major differences in participation by occupation and educational level in the 1950s, no obvious inequalities were apparent in the 1980s, 1990s or noughties, the 2000s. Okay. I've described sports participation in the Nordic region as a whole in terms of more people doing more sport than ever before across all age groups, both sexes and across social class fractions. I've pointed to the later peak in participation among 16 to 19 year olds, which is counterintuitive, and the bounce back in late middle age to the participatory levels of 20 somethings. I want now to try to explain what I've just described in participatory terms. As we've seen, the Nordic countries have unusually high rates of sports participation. But does this mean that there's something particular, not to say peculiar about them, that creates favorable circumstances for sports participation? Well, the answer in the words of Vicky in Little Britain is yeah, but no, but. Let me try to explain. What the Nordic countries reveal is how favorable conditions for sports participation can be formed from the cultural traction, favorable socioeconomic conditions, a political commitment to resourcing sport and sports facilities, alongside a suitable physical environment. Now, by cultural traction, I mean populations, people who are socialized into habitual involvement in sport. They grow up expecting to take part in sport and taking part in sport. By favorable socioeconomic conditions, I mean relatively narrow differentials between socioeconomic groups, between classes and sexes. A political commitment to resourcing sport and sports facilities and a suitable natural and human made physical environment are self-explanatory. Now each of these, I argue, may be necessary. Together, they appear very likely to be sufficient. They appear to be enough to get large swathes of a population involved in sport when young and throughout the life course. All in all, then, my argument is that sports participation should be considered largely a secondary effect, a byproduct of more fundamental, wider socio-economic and political structures. But also population-based cultural values, like valuing sport, habitually taking part in sport, as well as processes, right? deep-seated socialization into sport, in the family, in schools, and so on. So what can we learn from this in the UK? Well, 
in short, while we may be able to do something about the process, we may be able to do something about socialising youngsters into sport in the family and in schools, it will, it must be acknowledged, take a big shift in political will to improve the more fundamental structures by reducing or narrowing differences between the sexes and the classes in the form of greater economic and social equality. And we can't shift cultural values overnight. It may well take several generations to make normative, to make it widely expected and accepted sports participation among UK citizens. So the upshot is that the Nordic countries are not true comparators for other countries. It is likely to be the greatest socioeconomic inequalities in countries beyond the Nordic lands that make the region unrealistic as a comparator, as a benchmark for sports participation. Not least because socioeconomic determinants of participation, class, gender, ethnicity, inevitably lie well beyond the control of sports policy. They lie inevitably beyond the control of school physical education as well, of course. All that said, the Nordic lands offer evidence for everyone's preferred policy for boosting participation. The so-called big society and volunteer participation, state support, great equality between the sexes, social classes and ethnic groups. Nordic government's pro-sport policies and pro-sport funding in particular appear to work because they operate through and complement a strong voluntary sector and work upon a population with particularly strong sporting exercise and physical recreation dispositions in environments, indoor and outdoor, conducive to physically active and sporting lifestyles. In short, increasing the sports participation of people in countries such as the UK to levels comparable with the Nordic countries may only be possible if governments adopt policies aimed at achieving more egalitarian, more equitable, more equal socioeconomic conditions. This, however, remains, of course, a big if. OK, folks, that's my mini lecture on sports participation and its implications for the UK. I'm happy, of course, to take as many questions as you may have now, either by you unmuting and asking me orally or take questions on the right hand side. I've got one here. Realistically, Ken, do you think it's possible in the UK to allow adopt the Scandinavian model then? What key thing change would be required? Well, as I've tried to say, the one big key change is not necessarily in the world of sport or in PE or even in sports policy. It's beyond PE. It's the same argument I put to students about the impact of PE and sport on health. The biggest impact to be had on health is indirectly. It's via food, it's via diet, it's via social class determinants. And the same applies to, to sports participation. It seems that what's changed in the Scandinavian countries is not just growing wealth. That's true. Greater degree of, of disposable wealth after, after the high levels of taxation, more money to spend on sport. It's also a narrowing of the gaps between the better off and the less well off. The less well off are better off than they were and have more money to spend on their leisure, more money to spend on sport. But at the same time, there's been a, a, a narrowing of differentials between the sexes, and this had a big impact. Around the Western world, the big increases that took part in sports participation in the 70s and 80s that plateaued in the UK and Western Europe, but carried on an upward trajectory in the, in the Scandinavian countries, the big driver in participation was the growth in female participation. And that was largely a measure of sex discrimination acts on and so forth, equal opportunities in the UK. In the Scandinavian countries, such as Norway, Finland, Denmark, they have gone one step further. They really have, as it were, equalised, um, to the extent they can, the lives of men and women. So there are as many women in the workforce as men. The class ceiling has diminished. It's easier for women to reach higher levels in the workforce. They have a quota system, by the way, where in the workforce... A certain proportion of women have to be interviewed for jobs. They have to get the higher jobs. They have to be in the higher roles. Bottom line is that women have closed the gap on men in the workforce. They are more likely now to stay in education than ever before. They stay in education. They go into higher education. They go into better and better jobs, higher and higher paid jobs. And they stay there longer 
and they delay having a family till their late 20s, early 30s. This means, the upshot of this is that, that young women are more likely to leave now lives typically associated with men 30 or 40 years ago in Scandinavia and still to some extent in UK currently. And that includes all forms of leisure activity, but especially sports participation. The knock-on effect of this, of course, is that young girls growing up in Norwegian and Scandinavian families are as likely now to see their mothers as role models for employment, for higher education, for leisure, but for sports participation, as they are to view their families in that way. So long answer short, the biggest impact on sports participation and leisure involvement generally will be greater equalization between the sexes, um, narrowing of income differentials between the classes, narrowing of differentials between ethnic groups. That will have the indirect, perhaps unintended, consequence of bringing women's South Asian Muslim groups, for example, lower working class groups, leisure and sporting lives up to and on a par with, with for example, middle class males. I hope that answers the question. And one thing I'll throw in out of interest is that, is that in the current, uh, in the current um, lockdown situation, the Norwegians are, are um, rele release, releasing people as it were back into the workforce. But one of the things under discussion at the moment in Norway is allowing women back into work before men. So all this kind of phased return to work that's been talked about in, in all countries, who goes first, what regions, which people, which work, which working, which occupational groups and so forth. The Norwegians are talking about bringing women back into the workforce first. Why? Because all the research has shown over the years that when women's leisure lives become more like men's, when women's lives become more like men, they tend to find themselves taking on the double shift, by which we mean they work all day, you know, at the, in the current climate, probably from home, they work all day, but then they take on a disproportionate amount of the domestic duties, the domestic responsibilities. Now, in the last few decades in the Western world, Scandinavian countries in particular, men have taken a greater and greater share of domestic responsibility. But the striking thing is the one aspect of home life that men have taken on disproportionately has been childcare and participation in sport. So it remains the case that it is women who are more likely to experience the double, the double shift, what was called famously uh, in sociology of leisure by Rosemary Deem, all work, no play, women's leisure, what leisure? Even in Scandinavia, women are likely to hold down a better and better daytime paid occupation, but at the same time do a disproportionate amount of the workforce. And the idea is, if women are released back into the workforce, then the pressure on them at home and their mental health generally should improve as well as their physical health. Okay, long-winded answer to that question. Any more questions? Happy to take them, keep them coming. Feel free to unmute folks if you if you want to ask me the question or uh, ask me a question orally. The one key thing, therefore, that would change is, is wider policy towards um, differentials between the classes and between the sexes. In sporting terms, if there's one thing you can change, it would be sporting facilities, access to sporting facilities. That does have an impact on sports participation. Okay, people managing this session are telling me that that may well be the end of the questions. As they say, feel free to get in touch with any questions to inquiries at chest or me directly, Ken Green, or one word lowercase, at chester.ac.uk. Thanks for being in attendance, folks. Hope to see you sometime. Hope I pass across at some time in the future. Cheerio. <laughs>